There we go. So this is the, uh, the title uh, of my presentation, and I, I, uh, I start now. So uh, the situation we are now in uh, this, with, with this uh, pandemic, uh, uh, of course, challenged not only the usual course of events, like uh, the fact that I'm now in Moscow and not in, uh, in, in the nice city of Megan, unfortunately. So, uh, but it challenged, of course, many essential cultural norms and, and worldviews. Uh, and I start with referring to what Giorgio Agamben and the uh, Italian philosopher explained at the, at the very midst of the ep ep uh, epidemic uh, back in April. How could it happen, he said, that the entire country, meaning Italy, uh, ethically and politically collapsed in the face of an illness? What is the limit beyond which you are not willing to give it up? I believe that the threshold that separates humanity from barbarism has been crossed, end of quote. Uh, and among uh, other things, he refers to the Catholic Church, which, uh, another quote, making itself the handmaid of science, the true religion of our time, has radically denied its most essential principles, and end of quote. So I'm not going to discuss uh, Agamben's uh, uh, diatribe that sound, sounded rather provocative uh, at the height of Italy's tragic days in uh, April. Um, but I pick up both his own position and his criticism of the church, uh, of the Catholic church in this case, to go further with my argument here. The pandemic questioned uh, the validity of essential principles, those essential pr principles that a government referred to. Uh, and there were, as we know, debates uh, within the Catholic Church and within other churches as well. Some Orthodox churches, including Greek, Coptic, uh, Armenian, uh, uh, and some other churches were closed during the uh, lockdowns. In other churches, the policy was more ambiguous, but cautiously followed the rules imposed by secular authorities. For example, the Russian and uh, uh, or Georgian churches didn't close. The ceremonies were served, but people were recommended to abstain from services and to uh, uh, and follow you know, local bishops and local authorities uh, and, and their recommendations. April 2020 was the time of, uh, uh, of the Pascha, of course, of Easter, and the impossibility to celebrate it in the church was dramatic for many, and there were many expressions of skepticism about lockdown, restrictions, and things like that, and even anger against restrictions of the feast, which ironically was supposed to celebrate overcoming death in principle. The whole thing was uh, a crisis that raised at the stakes around those essential principles that uh, we, uh, that Agamben uh, referred to, the essential principle that was supposed to define Christian orthodoxy. Um, here's another uh, slide. Uh, uh, I, I hope you can see it. Uh, material or physical or spiritual Eucharist. In-person or online liturgy. Communal celebration or individual prayer. Sticking to tradition or accommodating new media forms and languages. Clergy-centric or more inclusive and laity oriented. Believing or belonging. Sacramental immunity, or the immunity that is received through the sacraments, or the discourse of the common good. Heroism of faith, or love for your neighbors. So all these kind of discourses, uh, kind of organized, organi we're organizing the debate around Orthodox identity. And uh, not just today, of course, but for decades, for the decades 
and they became dramatically revealed and galvanized during the pandemic. So my goal here, my goal here in this paper is to outline the issue of Christian Orthodox identity. Identity is, of course, uh, a tricky concept. Uh, now there is a growing intuition about the fluidity of all kinds of racial, uh, ethnic, sexual, and religious identities. Uh, in the era of hyperconnectivity, identity becomes too light, too fluid, and so elusively multiple and circumstantial. So speaking of Christian Orthodox identity in general, we are now careful to keep in mind a long repertoire of social, cultural frames that make this identity split into pieces. And yet we also know that self-reference continues to be a necessity. There are plenty of texts and events that attest the respective identity becoming a commitment or as an agenda. So, but the real effect of any attitude, any commitment, any action, any agenda, may differ for a conference of bishop, bishops, a local priest, or a lay follower. And it may vary uh, across all kinds of specific locations and frames, from a monk uh, in a, uh, uh, on Mount Athos, to an average Greek priest, to an Ethiopian uh, peasant, or to a first generation Romanian uh, a Romanian immigrant in Italy, or a, uh, uh, so to speak, minimal self-proclaimed non-practicing Christian Orthodox in deep Russia. So all this variety is, uh, 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 is uh, uh, should be taken in, into account. So we should keep all these reservations when we refer, for example, to some big global research uh, surveys uh, 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 that, uh, uh, for example, the Pew Research Center's 2017, 2017 survey, big survey covering all uh, 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 Eastern Orthodoxy of Byzantine tradition and Oriental churches as well. So all Christian Orthodoxy. And, uh, uh, here are some, some of the results of this survey. Uh, according to, uh, to the study, Christian Orthodox make up 4% of the world population, approximately, uh, showing decline from an estimate 7% in uh, 1910. Uh, among them, Eastern Orthodox Commonwealth makes up around 80% and Oriental churches 20%. Russia alone makes up about 40% of all. Uh, there are seven European countries with the Orthodox diasporas making more than 100,000 people. The largest non-European location is Ethiopia. However, residents of Europe, including Russia, make up 77% uh, of all Christian Orthodox worldwide. Interesting that the share hasn't been such a dramatic decrease since 1910, as did Roman Catholicism and uh, Protestant churches. Uh, so mm, uh, that moved uh, with a kind of a shift to the south. So this kind of shift was not that um, uh, clear and not that uh, uh, obvious or in, uh, in, in, in the case of, uh, of the uh, Orthodox Christians. So these figures, are useful, but they say little about the real work of religious identity, and even less about it, its content. Uh, what can turn a declarative identity into a real agency? That is something that we need to explore. Um, there are plenty of studies that, that show that the moral, economic, and political empowerment may be one mechanism that hardens this light declarative identity and create a real agency and commitment. Um, and uh, well, this mechanism probably worked in post-Soviet lands in the 1990s after the, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, 
when a symbolic empowerment was needed as the social order crumbled or was in transition. In most cases, however, to my view, to my opinion, the strengthening of religious identities and commitments uh, are reactive and negative, so to speak. Uh, they come as a response against all kinds of threats. So uh, this may be existential threat, uh, as for example, for the Orthodox Christian in the, in the Middle East. Uh, it may be also the threat of deprivation, uh, usually related to minority status or the condition of diaspora. Finally, it can be a cultural threat coming from sources um, uh, uh, perceived as alien or leading to globalized mixtures and things like that. For example, the resistance, as, uh, as examples, I, I, I can refer to the, the resistance of Euro, uh, European Union's normative uh, uh, resist, uh, to uh, European nor, uh, uh, Union's normative culture in old Christian Orthodox lands such as Greece, Cyprus, Romania, and Bulgaria, or frustrations in some relatively recent Orthodox diasporas in the West. In a special case of Russia, too, it can be seen uh, you can see how the symbolic Orthodox commitment serves to fasten the geopolitical fears formatted in terms of sort of civilization, as I would call it, a kind of a post-Huntingtonian mythology that serves to imagine a bastion of defense against globalized others, be they liberal, Western, Islamic, or Chinese. In all these cases, the cultural threat activates some deep, long-term scripts um, that contain a mixture of religious and cultural habits in these communities. So the next step is to see what are these long-term -term habits or scripts in Christian Orthodox memory. Um, I think that uh, what was really essential in, uh, in, in this memory of the ex experience uh, for Christian Orthodox uh, was two things, the, uh, uh, the experience of alienation and the experience of imperial hegemony. Let me explore this in some, uh, in, in some detail. Um, the sense of alienation is multi-layered, of course, it's complex cultural uh, disposition. It goes back, of course, to the very depth of the Christian math message, the kerygma, uh, the early opposition of the city of God to the city, uh, earthly city. This attitude of being out of this world is shared with other old Christian traditions. For Eastern churches, though, uh, this fundamental ontological alienation is supplemented with the historical alienation. Um, mm, uh, of being under alien cultural hegemony. So the history of Ottoman empires, the most obvious example, of course. This was the real experience of cultural alienation, physical survival, and genocides. <clears throat> it was also the period of intellectual cultural captivity, sort of closure, that produced an inclination towards mostly conservative attitudes. The byproduct of this experience was a certain reformatting of the, uh, really, uh, of the tradition, a specific mode of ethnocentric, uh, ethno-religious deployment, so to speak. Uh, for example, uh, within the Millet system, and later national religious redeployment in the time of rising nationalism and wars of independence, when Greek, Bulgarian, Serbian, and other national churches emerged. Hence the philatism, the ethnocentric religious identity that was condemned as, as heresy uh, at the Pan-Orthodox Synod in uh, 1872 and yet became the constituent feature of Christian Orthodox identity, distinguishing it from, from other Christian traditions. It most uh, its most recent chapter was the confessionalization of the post 
Yugoslavia nations and the new Ukraine. The third layer of this memory of alienation is a broader process of secularization. Secularization was experienced by all Christian communities, of course. However, in the lands of Eastern Christians, the experience was special first um, because of the, its extreme radicalism, secularization in the communist lands. And secondly, in the Christian East, secularization was felt as Western heresy, a Western apostasy that makes a difference. Another type of experience was, was imperial hegemony, and it was shaped first during the first centuries of the Byzantine history and then during the Russian uh, imperial expansion. Byzantine past is a kind of a lieu, lieu of the memoir uh, of an imagined imperial uh, globalist, now very much uh, transformed though. Uh, the Russian case is a special combination of post-Byzantine imperial universalism, Russian ethnocentric exclusivism, and ambiguous relationship with the Russian secular state. The Russian Christianity was paradoxically combining this sense of alienation since Peter the Great's reforms and on the communist rules, of course, with the experience of ideological hegemony partly restored or kind of imagined as restored in a way in, in the post-communist times. So both, type, bo both types of experience, alienation and imperial hegemony, as it seems, have had hard times in accommodating with modern changes of the recent centuries. Practically all orthodox theological schools were less able to come to terms with modernity than most Roman Catholic and Protestant traditions. Example, um, one example is of course, George Florovsky and Lovsky's school of neopatristics, but I'm not going to um, into detail here. These theological attitudes correlated with relative ecclesiastic and ecclesiastical and liturgical conservatism. Now, when we turn to the adaptive experience within presumably secular globality, which is one of the uh, major themes uh, of this conference, of course, I propose uh, another simple typology. Um, there are two basic attitudes that guarantee to an extent special Christian identity, withdrawal and engagement. Speaking of withdrawal, withdrawal is based on extreme sense of alienation, going back to the experiences under pagan or aggressively atheist powers, or it may be a softer term form of creating a parallel social reality within a post-Christian uh, environment now. As for engagement, engagement attitude, it, it, had, uh, it, it has much more much more uh, various motives, of course. The first may be just a pragmatic survival strategy. You need uh, to be in negotiation with the word, world to save your community. Another option is a radical activist mission towards uh, converting the world through direct mission, so to speak. However, there can be also the mission of another kind uh, so to speak, an indirect mission, the position of witness uh, with the goal of improving the world, a movement of piety uh, driven by an assertive religious agency. Such a strategy can be uh, further split into more conservative, modernity defensive, so to speak, or moder modernity hostile in a way, or conversely, modernity friendly. Um, one example of the first one in, uh, in the Orthodox history would be probably uh, the Zoya movement in, uh, in, uh, in Greece. Uh, uh, the second, so to speak, modernity-friendly option is typical, of course, to, um, to American Protestant theology, going back to the social gospel movement and things like that. And uh, it uh, uh, had been only uh, uh, 
have been only marginally present um, in, uh, in uh, uh, Christian orthodoxies. Um, mm, uh, there is also an attitude that, I, uh, uh, that can be called a virtuous option, the last one in this slide, as you see. Um, uh, that, that was mostly expressed by uh, uh, people like Alexander Schmemann in the 20th century and Olivier Clement uh, and some others an option of Homo Eucharisticus, seeking, seeking an experience of being liturgically together and being present within this world without breaking with it. Uh, uh, but that is really a very rare virtuoso option, I would have to say. So we see a wide range of identi uh, identitarian strategies here. Going back to my question, uh, uh, the main question of this, of my paper actually, is this identity as light as it, uh, uh, the, Christian, uh, the Christian Orthodox identity is as light as is about to almost disappear in the process of, in this process of accommodation to the modern secular world? Or is it a burden that hampers the course of this accommodation? that create the problems on this course? Or is there a smart middle way? So, now uh, moving further, what we can do is to refer to attempts by Eastern churches to formulate a common ground in the polls uh, issue, to, uh, to make a kind, of, uh, a kind of a sketch of Eastern Orthodox uh, Eastern Christian Orthodoxy as a sort of ideal type, an imagined project. And this issue, the issue of such a project, has been central to the history of so-called pan-Orthodox movement, although that refers, of course, mostly to Eastern Orthodox communities and not to the Oriental churches. Um, uh, so dear to the organizers of this conference, uh, but let me stop uh, uh, at uh, the pan-Orthodox on pan-Orthodox movement uh, within uh, uh, Eastern Orthodox. This idea was a long history, has a long history, and then uh, in 2016, as you know, this uh, uh, synod uh, in Crete um, uh, uh, happened finally, and the success was only partial although a hard consensus was found during the pre-synodal discussions, four churches dropped at the very last moment. Uh, what interests me in uh, terms of the issues I am discussing here uh, is one document adopted in Crete, uh, the document called uh, The Mission of the Orthodox Church in Today's World. Uh, this document was supposed to define the global identity of Eastern Christianity in today's world. A sort of allusion to um, a 1965 Roman Catholic Gaudium et Spes, the uh, so-called pastoral constitution of the Catholic Church, um, adopted in uh, 1965. So the mission document uh, uh, adopted here in uh, uh, Crete um, mm, was a result of hard, hard, really hard negotiations. It was a compromise rather than a consensus. I had made uh, a, a special research on this document and published uh, an article on it. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I saw, I followed the, the whole process on the several stages of preparation and uh, uh, during the negotiations over this document, over the text, uh, over the few years, a more personalist theology, uh, theology promoted by Metropolitan um, John Ziziulis, who was heading the preparatory group at that time. Um, uh, uh, this personalist theology has been kind of downplayed and a more morally and socially conservative elements have been introduced into the document. So, was as a kind of a mixture uh, uh, of uh, discourses, and uh, we can say the document is quite critical of the world, of the modern secular world. Not radically critical, though, but rather defensive, so to speak. Um, to understand in what sense this uh, 20, 
16 synodal mission document was a compromise, we should place it in the mental, on a mental map of other similar texts. And we cannot embrace, of course, all possible texts, so I, I picked uh, only two. Uh, the first is the basis of the social concept of the Russian Orthodox Church uh, 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 that was uh, created in uh, uh, 2000. And the second one is um, uh, the document called For the Life of the World, so it's the social ethos of the Orthodox Church published in 2017 with endorsement of the Patriarch of Constantinople. The latter text was clearly the response to the first one. So it, it was clear and kind of antithesis in a way. So we see the two major actors here, the Patriarch of Moscow, Patriarch of Constantinople, who really define <coughs> uh, major actors, major geopolitical, orthodox geopolitical players who define um, uh, the, uh, the, the discussions, actually, in a way. And if we compare the two institutions, we can imagine the two different poles of today's orthodox identity. The Russian Patriarchate claims the largest numbers of followers. It is economically most powerful, politically very close to the state, bound with territory and ethnicity, ideologically combining typical Orthodox nationalism and a tradition of imperial civilization, and what, what I called before, civilizationism. The Patriarchate of, uh, Patriarchate of Constantinople has no larger following. It relies upon the diaspora, mostly in the US. Uh, it can be characterized as super na uh, national, ecumenical, and territorially, ethnically, culturally, and politically unbound. So we, relatively unbound at least, we have here the two models uh, of institutional ecclesial identities, embodied and disembodied, so to speak, hard and soft. And the other Orthodox churches, in terms of their institutional, in, institutional uh, 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 constitution, their attitude to the world, may be placed along the, uh, this hard versus soft dichotomy. The discursive field of Christian orthodoxy is defined by their confrontation. And we see how different are the discourses of the two mentioned documents in terms of both theological and ideological thinking. The Russian 2000 document is oriented towards uh, close cooperation with the state, collective national identity, more, it, it is morally more restrictive and close. It is ambivalent towards democratic politics and protective against liberalism and secularism associated with the West. By contrast, the Constantinople endorsed document is clearly pro-modern, pro-democratic, uh, centered upon individual rather than collective forms of faith and expressions, clearly more inclusive in terms of morality. These two strategies are not extremes. There are extremes from both sides, and, and uh, um, of course, and, uh, but an imaginable median worldview, it might be, if we think of imaginable, uh, imaginable uh, median worldview, it uh, uh, might be somewhere in between these two poles, uh, these two positions, where the real picture is a patchwork, being a patchwork with huge variety of nuances a kind of an identitarian spectrum. To make further precision, let me address yet another text, and this, this will be the last one, um, the, uh, 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 which is called the um, Moral Discernment in the Churches, a study document produced by World Council of Churches, of, uh, of which the um, uh, uh, Christian Orthodox churches are uh, a part. Uh, and that's a kind of a study document uh, uh, of two, uh, 2013, um, and this document reflects a kind of internal debate within the ecumenical process on a variety of moral issues. In many cases, the document singles out, singles out the Christian Orthodox position as specific and different from the rest of the churches that are making part of the World Council. What are the main lines of uh, such differences? Uh, very uh, quickly, most uh, uh, blatant, most blatant contra contradiction concerns the issues somewhere at the intersection of biological, social, and 
cultural practices such as gender equality, sexuality, and uh, bioethics. Here, the position of Orthodox is said to clearly diverge from the ecumenical mainstream defined mostly by Protestant churches, of course. Um, each uh, case brings up its own special discussion. For example, the abortion issue contains a hard conflict over the definition of human dignity based upon the concept of personhood. If we choose between the fetus and the pregnant, pregnant woman who among the two possesses a fuller personhood, endow it with fuller human dignity. Another uh, example, euthanasia. Here the wager is be between sanctity of life and personal autonomy, uh, you know, defined as God's gracious gift of freedom. So both sanctity of life and uh, 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 freedom uh, are some uh, two things that uh, we should uh, uh, pick one, uh, should uh, make a choice from. Um, and uh, uh, um, uh, another example is euthanasia, for example. Here the wages uh, that, that, that I just mentioned. So uh, in most cases, in most, most uh, of these issues, the orthodox position is defined as less inclusive, less pro-choice, less oriented towards individual autonomy. Uh, interesting that the authors of this document explain how they explain on a higher level of reflection the causes of differences, the methodology of reasoning. And this is also important, and this is probably the last point that I will uh, discuss here. Uh, what is not acceptable to the orthodox in terms of methodology of thinking, of reasoning about those uh, uh, moral and social issues. What is not acceptable is what they call relativistic methodology. That is a growing acceptance of a wider range of secular sources, the overemphasis of non-theological academic sources, I, uh, this, this was a quote, in contrast to what is called faith sources that include scriptures and uh, of course, more specifically to the Orthodox, the consensus fidelium, uh, the uh, entirety of church experience, the church tradition. So at the final analysis, it is a classical issue about the nature of human, human reason that can be either God's blessing or a challenge against God. So I stop here with a few uh, final comments. Um, uh, uh, after this kind of overview of the discourses that are defining the orthodox identity. The events of this year have created, in spite of all lockdowns, uh, an unprecedented effect of globality. Paradoxically, however, the global anxiety stressed and highlighted all kinds of controversy, all kinds of conflicts and identity borders. And this is rather banal dialectics, uh, which is inescapable here, though. The pandemic made stronger a cross-denominational religious message. At the same time, this message was opposed very clearly uh, to the secular worldviews and pragmatic political decisions. Also, the situation of disorder and anxiety exacerbated the internal pluralism over many ideas and practices, and this led to questioning stereotypic, stereotypical imagined identities at all levels. The deep internal debate around essential principles of Christian orthodoxy can be clearly seen through the analysis of the reactions to this crisis we live uh, uh, in. So this would be a great research endeavor, and uh, uh, actually, uh, I was trying to uh, to organize uh, uh, a couple of uh, uh, I, I, may, I was involved in, in, in a couple of calls of four papers in, uh, in international journals uh, in, uh, to bring together um, uh, studies of the reactions of different religious uh, institutions to the pandemic, and uh, I hope uh, uh, we are going to have a, a couple of uh, special issues in, uh, in uh, academic journals on, on this matter, uh, but uh, uh, 
maybe it's too early to start such a research because we are still now in the midst of the of the of the process. So anyway, uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention, and uh, I'm done for today. Thank you.